Okay. Well, I'm good. I'm good. Right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you Hello. for joining us. My name is Michael Landis. I'm here on behalf of the Saratoga County History Center, located in Boston Spa, New York. Mm -hmm. So welcome to all of you who are not from the county. Uh, this is part of a monthly speaker series we have called Experts Next Door, uh, originally conceived as a way to connect uh, community with local experts, literally next door or down the road, but the pandemic uh, put us all online and put us all uh, at the mercy of Zoom or uh, the blessings of Zoom and suddenly okay. next door could mean anywhere, even uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, where uh, Dr. Oh. Stewart is. So he can be virtually next door. So it's, it still works for us. So thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, like I said, this is a, a monthly speaker series and we cover all different kinds of topics from professional scholarship to um, hobby stuff like gardening. I think in next month, our topic is uh, European chocolate making from the 18th century or uh, chocolate house that's I know nothing about chocolate making so please pardon my uh, my ignorance of that topic uh, someone else will be hosting that event <laughs> um, but it, it is part of our series just to give you a sense that every month it's something different and something exciting we try to reach out and find uh, the people who are um, causing the most trouble if you will doing the most exciting thing um, really pushing the boundaries of whatever they're working on and, and Dr. Stewart certainly uh fits that bill. Now, before I introduce Dr. Stewart, we get started, I would like to just do a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping issues here. First of all, if you want to open up your chat, it should be, uh, you can see at the bottom of your screen there, a button mark chat. And I'm going to post something there now. If you have questions or comments, uh, please uh, post them there. We okay. have a large group. Oh. Uh, we have 37 right now, but that could expand up into the upper 40s. Uh, so instead of people trying to holler over each other, uh, I think it'd be best to post your comments and questions on the right side there. And I'll leave it up to Dr. Stewart if he wants to address them as you post, or perhaps uh, he'll just hold on to questions and comments until the very end. Uh, and we could have a discussion that way, uh, whatever works for him. Uh, also, I request that uh, you mute yourself. Uh, as, as Isabel, my, my fellow trustee, has pointed out, dogs and children and uh, dinner dishes or um, whatever else might occur, meteor strikes, uh, alien attacks, um, could uh, you know, cause noise and distraction. So if you could just mute yourself, that'd be great. And just post all your questions and comments there on the side. We'll promise to get to them. I think that's it for housekeeping issues. Uh, so let me turn now to Dr. Stewart and give a little intro for him. Uh, Dr. Stewart is a professor uh, of history emeritus at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, he is one of the foremost experts on United States politics, law, and race. His books, especially his books on abolitionism are assigned reading in both undergraduate and graduate courses. It's hard to take a history class in this country without uh, bumping into Dr. Stewart's work. Uh, he has appeared in several of the American Experiences historical documentaries. He is co-editor of the Louisiana University Press's series on abolition, anti-slavery, and the Atlantic world. He has spoken widely on college campuses. Equally important, Dr. Stewart has devoted his life to combating bigotry, racism, and slavery. In 2010, he founded Historians Against Slavery, an international coalition of scholars dedicated to raising awareness of modern forms of unfree labor. Yes, slavery still exists, sadly. In 2016, he spearheaded a national effort to save historically backed colleges and universities, starting with Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. Furthermore, he is the author, uh, I'm sorry, he's the founder and director of the Celebrate American Heroes Project, which employs history to inspire a new generation of activists. And uh, just last year, in fact, just a couple months ago, he launched a national campaign against racism called, quote, Jim Stewart's Historical Tonic for Fragile White Folks, a series of online videos that boldly confront white supremacy uh, and social injustice today. I'm sure Dr. Stewart will talk about that. And when we're done, you can go on YouTube and uh, watch Dr. Stewart take on, take on the, the, the bigotry uh, in real time. Uh, so with that, I turn it over to Dr. Stewart. Thank you. Well, uh, gee, uh, 
I'm seldom at a loss for words, but that's what Michael does to you, I think. <laughs> and so thank you so much for such a <clears throat> generous introduction and um, seeing all these faces here, all of us being very, very small. I wish that somehow we were in a classroom together because that's my accustomed way of uh, interacting with people is be able to do it you know, in three dimensions rather than what we're doing now. But uh, my job, I guess, is to be a local expert from here in St. Paul, Minneapolis. And what I'm supposed to be talking about is from classroom to community, which is a, a simple little title that once one begins to unpack, it becomes very, very, very challenging. And in order to be able to explain the kind of crazy work that I'm in now, which is largely involved with uh, doing provocative videos, selling activist sportswear, uh, getting involved in trying to create the answer to the MAGA hat. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we'll talk about that I'm doing nowadays that all spin off from the fact that one way or another over a long period of time, I wrote a ton of stuff about the anti-slavery movement and the coming of the Civil War, which other people were ill-advised enough to read <laughs> and to spend a lot of time talking about. And so a, a prelude to all this, and this is something that Michael can confirm, I've, I've had a big, big, long academic career that's put me into public life for a long, long time. I'm 80 years old, and I got my PhD in 1968, so you can do the math. The problem that got me involved in this business started in 1968 or before, living in Cleveland, Ohio, having just graduated from Dartmouth College where I played basketball. And the Ivy League during the time that I was playing uh, was all white. There was one black guy who played for the University of Pennsylvania named John Edgar Weidman, who turned out to be a wonderful poet and author. But everybody else was white, and the prep school league that I played in when I was a kid was all white. Came from a very privileged background. Finished my four years. I don't know how many people have had this experience in their own lives, but the minute you lose your team after you've been playing a long time with the same group of people, and you go on to the next stage of your life, it's like losing a huge component of what keeps you stable and balanced. So back I go to Cleveland, Ohio, trying to figure out how to keep my game up, not knowing who to play with any longer, severed from the whole community. And once I got back and took a look at what was around, the people who were playing the best basketball were all black people. And it was all in rec centers way downtown. And the game that was being played there was a game that I had not learned. It was a lot closer to above the rim. It was a lot quicker than what I was used to. Uh, the defenses were a whole lot more complicated and the language that went with it was something that I had to learn all over again because you didn't learn that in the Ivy League. So I found myself going to rec centers in all black neighborhoods being the only white guy. <laughs> and being the only white guy not only sets up the stereotype that white men can't jump, which is not true, they can sometimes. But further than that, the idea of somehow being really very clearly a body out of place, really badly out of place. Everybody else is black. I walk in, nobody knows me. Nobody wants to pick me. Nobody wants to play with me. And slowly I had to work my way into being able to wedge my way into this thing. In order to do that, I had to, what? <sighs> camouflage certain qualities about me. It's like cross-talking from the other side where black English becomes white English when people want to be black and respectable. I had to go the other way with all that. And so right from the very beginning, I began to understand through sports what this problem about color is really all about because I found myself quite incidentally on the receiving end of it. At the same time, I was working as a clothing salesman in a big department store where I ran into a guy named Joe Shalkevich, who is obviously not black, he's Polish, and he's a great basketball player. And I hadn't known him before either. But I started going to gyms with him, and suddenly I began to realize that there's a whole Roman Catholic uh, Central European side of all this, which now expresses itself in the NBA and uh, great players that come from places like Bosnia and Herzegovina 
so forth. So suddenly in the city of Cleveland, I'm all mixed up in ethnicity and race and basketball, and the sport is the only vernacular that seems to hold us together. Uh, but after a while, more than that begins to make me start thinking about how did it get this way. Then in 1967, after I've been doing this for a couple of years, Cleveland exploded in racial violence. Cleveland's one of the most segregated cities in the, in the nation. It's one of the most impoverished. It's one of the first to go into in, uh, deindustrialization. And it's a very, very difficult and rough city for dark skinned people to live in. And uh, as a consequence of the big rebellions that happened after the assassination of Martin Luther King, uh, I saw tanks with metal tread tearing up the asphalt down the main streets of Cleveland, Ohio. And in the moment, I realized that all this stuff that I was doing with basketball had something very much to do with what I was seeing in front of me. Then I read a little story in the paper, which was very nicely written, and it reported that angry African Americans had burned down an elementary school called the Joshua Giddings Public School School. It was just an elementary school. And I wondered, as I read down the story, what was going on here. And the story emphasized that the school had been named for a great anti-slavery congressman who'd come from this part of Ohio, Joshua R. Giddings, who served in Congress longer before the Civil War than any other representative and was just a fierce and militant abolitionist that gave everybody hell for a period of about 20 years. The little story was about the irony of African Americans burning down this thing that had been named after somebody who was a great, great proponent of emancipation. And suddenly I said to myself, there's something here that I want to find out about. Turns out that the Joshua Giddings papers that nobody ever really spent much time with are right down to the Ohio Historical Society. Uh, he represented a district that was only about 15 miles away from my own house. <laughs> and this is all a long way of saying that the way that some of us get into history, and this is true for Michael as much as it is for me, and Michael is a very, very talented historian who's written a terrific book about white racism and the Democratic Party. Did you know that? Uh, it's a book that has caused a lot of controversy because it's against the grain. It talks very strongly in no uncertain terms with great documentation about the same problem that I'm involved with too. That's part of how we got to be friends. The point though is that uh, my introduction to history was to simply ask a question, who's responsible for this? Where did all this come from? How come there's all this anger and all this alienation and all this violence? The question is a contemporary question that demands a historical answer. One doesn't get into the kind of history that Michael and I are engaged in without having a really gigantic moral gripe about the way the world works. It's just the way it is. It, it was interesting. Uh, my other choice before all of this began to happen, uh, I was interested in the past. I was interested in history. And as an undergraduate at Dartmouth, I was a medievalist. And uh, I'm a very good Latin student. I'm good with words. I understand vocabulary. And I started learning Greek. And the reason for studying that was entirely different. It's, it's about the pastness of the past. You know what I mean? That uh, the age of great cathedrals and, and scholastic philosophy is a world that we've lost and coming back to unpack it again allows you to amplify and enhance your world in ways that you never thought of before. But this kind of work, the kind of work that Michael and I do is all about pulling the past into the present, not getting a big long but uh, aperture between the two. So the idea then was to teach and write about this stuff in a way that would change the world. Seriously, uh, I grew up in a generation that's a lot older than Michael's and it's all full of the people who from the civil rights movement decided to rewrite American history from the standpoint of making African-American history into American history. And that's where all the PBS documentaries came from. That's where a lot of the textbook writing came from. That's where a lot of the consulting has come from. And the net effect, at least for me, I've realized is that we didn't succeed in doing that. That the tremendous amount of work that's gone into the development of African-American history as a field and into the study of white supremacy as a problem 
is something that we all know deeply about. We historians, we know tons about this stuff. Yet at the same time, we've never been able to make the interface, the close connection between what we know and what citizens learn. Instead, uh, you know, if you deal with what kids actually know about, uh, about the past, some of them don't know who Abraham Lincoln is. The problem of being able to democratize the study of the past so that it actually has a deep, deep rooting in contemporary political discourse is the problem that we have not been able to face. Just to give you an example, the best film that I've ever seen, and that probably you've ever seen too, is one that has its origins right in your neighborhood, it's 12 Years a Slave. It's an incredible film. Nobody's let off the hook in this film. And I was just told, reminded that Saratoga Springs is where the film starts, I'm sure you've all seen it. That film grossed more box office in continental Europe than it did in the United States. The people who went to see that film already knew what it was about. Our problem is we speak in an echo chamber. We speak to each other. We speak to the converted. That's what I'm doing right now, <laughs> right? That it's hard to preach past the choir to be able to move in a much more direct measure into the world where really historical discourse has been dominated for a long, long time by Bill O'Reilly. Academics speak a code language to each other. We think that what we write makes a difference even though our books only sell 800 copies. A wonderful big, big, big effort to change all that, which I really hope that you have enough time to be able to look at, is a huge four hour documentary that's just been done by Henry Louis Gates on Reconstruction. Um, which is four one hour segments of the period of time after emancipation, where the second American Revolution started and then got aborted when it came to the question of, of race and citizenship. It's a brilliant piece of work. It's full of just incredible images, um, testimony from scholars who are fully full of authoritative things to say. Um, and at the same time, that's the kind of thing that's going to show on channel two the public broadcasting system, who's going to watch it? Is it going to get into the school system? No. Is it, do people have enough time to watch four hours worth of this kind of stuff in this age? No. What I'm trying to suggest is that what really bothers me and what I want to try and bring forward today, and this is why I'm so glad I'm talking to people here right in this particular little television set that I'm looking at, is the business of making that connection. How do we beat Bill O'Reilly? <laughs> or the kind of popular history that looks really chic, that, oh, who would be a good example of that? Who wrote T Doris Kearns Goodwin? Lots of facile stuff that shows up about, the, you know, how history teaches us this and this and this and this other thing. Isn't this interesting and this fun? And, you know, Michael Beschloss gets on, uh, for 10 minutes here and there, basically to just be filler around the headlines. Whereas what we're involved with, and what Michael and I are certainly involved with, is a deep, deep, deep objection to the way the world works and asking the question, where did this come from? And what, what can we tell you about it? And how can we deal? History is narratives. It's the stories you tell in your head. Uh, those stories can be as individual as all the people that I'm looking at right now. And they can be anything you want them to be. And a narrative of white supremacy is a narrative that's so heavily embedded in so many people's minds for such a long time that it really is almost instinctive. How do you change that? How do you mess with people's heads <laughs> to the point that they will argue with themselves and with each other about changing their minds? Because we know from social psychologists that changing people's minds is almost impossible. So that's my work. 
That's what I do. And that's what I read into being the expert next door who's supposed to talk to you about classroom and community. Any questions? By the way, I'll take questions and have anybody interrupt me at any time with anything you want to shoot through, Michael, and I'll just respond to it right now. I don't want to do this later. Because if I'm talking all the time and you are just listening all the time, it gets to be kind of hypnotic and people can easily go to sleep or just blank out or anything you want to do. So if you think that what I'm saying is uh, worth questioning, worth having me elaborate on or worth you, which would be better elaborating on, do it right now. Okay. You're just the, uh, you're the traffic cop, aren't you, Michael? I'd rather not be a police officer, but sure. I'm, okay, you are, you're officer friendly. Uh, that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, looks like Piper has a question. You wanna go ahead, Piper? So you were asking- Oh my gosh, oh. Piper's here. Oh. Hi, Elise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so you were asking how, how could we make a change? Like, um, well, what's going on right now when, when people are hit emotionally or scared to death, somehow they can reimagine the way things were or what their beginnings were or how they look at things. I think we're at a point now where a lot of people do want to know, you know, with Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. with the Capitol being taken over, Reconstruction is, is, is kind of being bandied about a lot lately, you know, it hadn't been for a really long time. Yep. So maybe this is the time, maybe. Well, that's what I think. I th that's why I'm, I, I'm just up to my, as my grandfather used to say, sorry to say this, up to my ass and alligators trying to figure out how to be able to take this moment and do something with it. Because I do think you're right, that right now we are questioning more than we ever have before, how it is that we got into this mess. And when people are anal uh, analogizing to a second civil war, the whole question of trying to figure out how to, first of all, not just get into one more piece of partisan gridlock, yes and no, but instead to try to figure out a way to invite us all into a deeper consideration of the problem of racial inequality, apart from anybody's political position. That's the important part. Well, doc, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, you, I think you're being too easy on yourself or too, too modest because uh, you you have bridged from the theoretical to the reality. I mean, you, you've created organizations yeah. that are affecting change and you've just launched this new video series that is going to be implemented in schools and in training programs. You want to talk a little bit about yeah. the, the video well, series or Historians Against Slavery? Okay, first of all, I want to sell some product. Okay, you ready? I am the one of the creators, along with a group of artists and clothing designers of a new activist clothing wear. Right now it's in the stage of t-shirts. They're called teachable t-shirts. And if you want to, and by the way, anybody who wants to know a lot about this stuff, just email me, stuart at mcallister.edu and I'll tell you all about it. There's a lot of websites, there's a lot of places to go to figure out about all this. Everybody has to ask themselves, who's this? Can you see her? Anybody identify her? No? Michael, can you? Tell us who she is. The Ida? Yeah, it's Ida B. Wells. Okay, Ida B. Wells was the great, great uh, uh, reporter, expose writer for the Chicago Defender, the big newspaper in Chicago that really was the national newspaper for African American people in the early part of the 20th century. All she did was report on lynchings and exposing white supremacy in the most incredible way she could. So if I'm walking down the street and I'm a big white guy and I'm wearing Ida B. Wells, I'm saying something about myself, right? That I wouldn't be saying if I didn't wear this shirt. But if you caught me in the checkout line, in the grocery store, you'd see that there's stuff on the back. And the stuff on the back is a parody of the old rock and roll tour t-shirt, all the cities you visit. Everything on the back is factual information about Ida B. Wells. That's a teachable t-shirt. We have another one here for W.E.B. Du Bois. And we have another one here for Harriet Tubman. 
Now, if you were in, if, if life were normal and we could do the things that we wanted to do, if you went to the National Museum of African American History gift shop, you'd find these things because that's where they're going. They're also at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, and you can buy them. I'll just send you the website. You can buy them if you want to in fairly large quantities and turn them over at close to wholesale prices so that you have extra income to be able to do anti-racist activity of one kind or another. We do it at discounts. And if you really want to get really super scary, I love doing this shirt. This is a shirt that has nothing on the back of it. If I walk down the street with this, it shows a black fist ringing the don't tread on me snake. And underneath it says, let freedom, W-R-I-N-G. What we're trying to create is the beginnings of a response to MAGA hat culture to proud boys who wear Hawaiian shirts. You understand what I'm talking about? In order to be able to make this bridge between the specialized academic knowledge that Michael and I have about how bad the world has gotten us to through history, we have to be able to induce people into conversations. Now, I live in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and up north of us is this giant expanse of Trump country. And I live up there in the summertime all the time. And I wear these shirts constantly. Into the grocery stores, into the hardware store, into the place where you can buy guns on end. And people look at me and they say, why are you wearing this shirt? And that's a very genuine question. Nobody has a clue about why I'm wearing this shirt, but it sure looks odd. And I say, thank you for asking. What made you want to ask that question? What happens then is a way to be able to have a conversation that I couldn't have otherwise. I can show them the back of the shirt. I can say, you know, the reason I'm wearing this shirt is because Harriet Tubman is really one of my great American heroes, along with George Washington and Benjamin Franklin and Abraham Lincoln. And so somebody who's not really thought about this stuff, except in the stereotypical way that Trump voters do in places that I hang out up there, they're 70, 80% Trump voters. I'm trying to develop a way to be able to get over the bridge of ideology in order to be able to make a opening so that we can consider the problem of white supremacy apart from our politics. You understand what I'm saying? I've also been attacked for wearing these shirts when you walk around the big hardware stores and box stores in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Why are you wearing that shirt? And I'll stop, lean into the anger, say, and say to him, whoever it is, it's always him, how come I'm upsetting you so much? I didn't mean to do that. This is just a shirt. Do you know who this, were, who this woman was and what she represents? The point I'm trying to make is very basic. And in order to do this, it, it comes easily for me because I've been doing it for so long. Most people who want to try to begin living this way have to do a tremendous disruption in their personal lives. I forget that I'm wearing this stuff. It's just part of me. But the idea of stepping out of the standard clothing that you've got to wear this stuff, to put a black face underneath your white face, when the first time you do it, or when you start doing it, you feel very self-conscious, you feel very exposed, all this stuff about white fragility runs through your head for a few minutes. And then after a while, you notice that it's just normal. And that's the way you go about leading your life. So the idea of turning all this academic history into personal testimony and disruption, the shirts, there are other ways of being able to do that. I did this big 16 part video series, which is the response to the white fragility book that I think you've probably heard about or read which denies that that's what we should be. We should be doing all this other stuff by studying the past instead. Um, it's been out for about three months now, 12 weeks. And a major um, consulting firm to big businesses is incorporating it into its diversity training programs. I'm working with about 10 different campuses to begin to get the videos used for campus-wide programming and campus community relations. Uh, several big congregations and churches, 
things like that. The idea is to infect people with the idea of wanting to know. And having the whole business of inquiry and inquisitiveness overcome the basic fear of black and white. So it's kind of a pop psychology that I just invented by myself as a consequence of the experiences that I've had that I tried to explain a little bit of to you just now. And that's the way it goes. So there's the videos. <laughs> there are the t-shirts. We're also working, I guess, have I mentioned that we're working on the antidote to the MAGA hat by creating an anti-MAGA hat, <laughs> which takes a tremendous amount of fundraising to do. It's a crowd. It's a crowdsourcing thing that probably will have a total budget to get it started of about $80,000. And I think we can do that uh, with the idea of being able to massively create a hat that's not red, but green. Red means stop, green means go. MAGA means make America great again. HT stands for Harriet Tubman and high time. If you see somebody walking down the street with you with a big red MAGA hat, I know exactly who that person is, right? The right wing has a beautiful way of visually identifying its membership. We don't have that. The symbolism that we have is divisive symbolism called Black Lives Matter and that kind of thing, where it's hard to get people to simply embrace it as a thing. But if I walk down the street with a bunch of other people and we've given away in Minneapolis and say, Paul, 20,000 hats, You've changed the political environment of the city of Minneapolis to St. Paul, right where George Floyd lives. So that's my project now. <laughs> and I'm working with some people who have a whole lot more money than I do with the idea of being able to do a matching crowdfunding funding operation where we match dollar for dollar up to $40,000 to be able to buy a ton of these hats and do just what Donald Trump did, give them away and have people wear them. Historians Against Slavery is a much more academic thing that I started after I began to think about the implications of contemporary slavery. That started back in about 2010. Um, Michael was the greatest possible co-founder of Historians Against Slavery you could ever imagine. This is where actually our relationship began. He is an absolutely monster internet promoter. And we needed to be able to communicate and expand out and build out our list and get all kinds of new stuff, blog posts, opinion pieces, uh, NPR, uh, what are they called? <laughs> little videos, little video, what are they called? I can't remember what they're called. Um, all embedded in this site. You got a wonderful person to do all the artwork to put the site together. And Michael got this membership expanded, going, expecting the monthly newsletter. He's just terrific. If you don't exploit him that way, you haven't re really exploited him and you're missing a big opportunity. <laughs> so uh, that is a way to try and take the problem of slavery and the South before the Civil War that we know a lot about and use what we know about it to be able to identify all over the world forms of unfree labor that then we can begin to start to work against. In other words, taking the knowledge of American history and applying it in a comparative way in order to be able to see what slavery looks like in the west coast of Africa, where little children are picking cacao beans for Nestle, just to get you started. But there's a lot of it. There's debt peonage, there's sexual slavery, all kinds of stuff. And along that line, we got very heavily involved with a <coughs> big outfit in Cincinnati called the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center that's gotten very interested in developing exhibits on contemporary slavery. And so that's part of what we do. We have a book series uh, that um, I got a volume together with another good friend of mine uh, published with uh, Cambridge University Press. So the uh, expert next door is trying to figure out how to make history make sense so that other people can think about it intelligently and not feel threatened by it or not feel lectured by it. You don't understand how bad the whole thing was. The minute somebody comes at you that way, the whole business of shutting down is exactly what happens next. And that's the problem. And I'll stop talking here because I've now been talking for how long? Almost 40 minutes, is that? No, 30 minutes. If you think, if I think about African-American experience in the United States, right from the very beginning, right from Phyllis Wheatley's poems, all the way to the most recent things that you can read from ta Coates. 
all that music, all that poetry, all those novels, all that scholarship, all of it has been a giant message to white America right from the very beginning. If you want to know everything that African-American people have been trying to teach white people for as long as there's been this problem, sit down for two hours and listen to James Baldwin. I don't know if you've seen the documentary of his expatriate career uh, in England and on the continent. Uh, I am not your Negro. Has anybody seen that? It tells you everything you need to know about what's wrong. Fred, one Frederick Douglass speech will do that for you. Seriously. Anything that comes out of the Harlem Renaissance will tell you that. Strange Fruit, the song. If you don't know the reference, you better find out. It's all about lynching. Billy Holiday. This message has been coming out of African-American consciousness and experience and creativity and improvisation for centuries. And in this moment in time, we haven't learned it. It's not for lack of trying. It's just that we don't want to hear, as a huge big culture, African-American voices lecturing us on what we've done wrong. You might like that. I might like that. Individually, we are receptive to this. But as a big, big culture, where we are right now with the Proud Boys, with the terrorists and the insurrectionists, that message hasn't made it. We failed. I told you that. At least I feel that we have. And we have to have new forms of being able to start again right now. We need to know who our friends are. We need to be able to see each of us walking around with a green hat <laughs> or a shirt or having one way or another taken steps to put anti-racist stuff into what church groups study, uh, what goes on in the workplace. That's what, the, that's what those videos are for. They're, they're very common sense. They're very short little videos. All of the terrible things that happened after emancipation are put together in 16 lectures, no one of which is more than nine minutes long. It's a tonic for fragile white folks, but it comes in small doses and you do it in a self-paced way. Okay. D so. Dr. Stewart, can you see your comment section? Do you have that open? Uh, I don't know how to be able to get into it unless I... Oh, I see hey, chat down here. Yeah, click on chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I am going to stop talking now. I've talked longer than no, I should. It's all right. If you want to scroll down to uh, Jennifer, I'm not sure who Jennifer is, but Jennifer. I, I see Jennifer's iPad to everyone. Yeah. Uh, so she wants to know if she can take your idea and maybe add to it, I think, if you want to take a look at what she's written. We, ha we have some abolitionist history here in the, uh, uh, or uh, in Troy. Sure. Uh, Troy, New York. Okay, uh, let me see. Jennifer, I want, uh, are you on the screen? Can I see you or can't I see you? I don't know where you are. Uh, I'll pretend that I do. Uh, the idea would be to create what exactly? Shirts? Okay, I would think that the best thing to do is to go immediately to find somebody who is really well connected into African-American fashion and, uh, and style which may not be easy to do in Saratoga Springs, but maybe it isn't. Or I'll put you in touch with our designer. Uh, her name is Kennedy Simpson. She's 24 years old. She's graduate of a art school in St. Paul, Minnesota. She and I have become, I'm her grandfather kind of at this point. Um, <clears throat> and she can begin to give you advice about how you put a shirt like that together. Okay? Stuart at McAllister.edu. Anything you want to know, or a question that you want to follow up on that has to do with any parts of this crazy program that I've been putting together, just email me and I'll get back to you. So we can do local history, shirt making consulting so that you can feel like you're moving in a good direction as you design the shirt that you think makes sense for you in the place that you are. Does that make sense? Help? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, now we have other messages. Do you want me to just scroll down? Uh, I, that's the only message I see that's been posted. Anyone have uh, other questions? I see six new messages. Oh, oh, there we go. We got one from Sean. Wait, Sean wait, says, wait, wait, where are you? Okay, scroll down two. to the bottom. I've got 
Jer, how to mitigate miseries of minority children. <clears throat> this, the way that, that aspects of the kind of stuff that I'm working with uh, fits in here, all has to do with what I've been doing at Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, where HBCUs and states that are desperately poor like Alabama, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, Louisiana, the black teachers who teach in all throughout these areas almost entirely come from HBCUs. Primary and secondary certification comes out of those places. There's a tremendous amount of work being done at Tougaloo by a colleague of mine named Roshunda Harris and another by the name of Johnny May Mayberry. They've developed a number of different interventions and things that you can use to be able to start thinking about how you take under-resourced and um, what would you call it? Um, chronically underserved kids and start to be able to figure out programs that are in school for interventions that work with that. Again, all I mostly am is kind of a big switchboard. Uh, I know lots of people. I get involved in lots of different projects. If you want to mitigate some uh, suggestions about mitigating the miseries of minority children in our community, you got to go to experts who do that all the time in some of the most miserable conditions that you can think of. I have other places and other people that I know who can help with that. Email me and I'll tell you about it, okay? And then we have Jennifer. Is that Jennifer? Okay. A lot of abolition. That's pretty much what we were talking about with the teacher. Yeah, yeah, that, like that before, right? Um, Sean had posted uh, a couple okay. minutes ago, Sean Kelleher, who's a historian here, asked, uh, how do you interpret the Blue Lives Matter PR campaign in a historical perspective? How do you trust it based on facts? Blue Lives Matter. <clears throat> In other words, we're talking about uh, we're talking about police. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. Uh, he, he just simply writes, "How do you interpret the Blue Lives Matter PR campaign in a historical perspective? How do you address it based on facts?" Okay. As a, what would you say to, to the uh, Blue Lives Matter crowd? I guess. Okay. There's an awful lot of, what would you call it? Misunderstanding about where police, formal police forces come from. They come initially from England. The first metropolitan police force that was ever put together was put together in London. And it was done with the recognition that you have to have during the middle of the industrial revolution with a tremendous amount of ethnic and labor unrest you have to have ways to be able to surveil and repress lots of different things that disrupt society because of inequality. The wonderful thing about the uh, municipal police is that they could be everywhere and they could be organized. Before that, you simply had patrols. You had citizens justice. You had a lot of posse comitatus that happened in cities. But once you start in the 1840s and 50s, then the idea of metropolitan police comes to big, big cities like New York City, Chicago, and so forth, and gets all tied up in ethnicity and in politics and in a lot of different things. So from the very beginning, the politics of race and class and struggle and privilege and not privilege is all tied up in the creation of these things. In other words, like anything else, this particular blue thing called the police department, which then gets professionalized during the 19 uh, teens and 20s, and then even more credentialed in the 1940s and 50s, uh, <clears throat> is something that, re that begins and continues as a response to systematic unrest and not simply the whole business of making sure that individuals who pro are prosecuted for crimes or people are defended against criminals. There's something systematic about it to begin with. Now, that, notice how I got into a big academic explanation that nobody can understand except me. That's part of the problem. I'm demonstrating it now about how hard it is for academics to speak straight to people. I've used a lot of academic language and a lot of big polysyllabic words to do this. At the same time, 
to go in a different direction. <clears throat> the idea of organizing white society to repress black people has been around since there's been slavery. Everybody knows about slave patrols. Uh, everybody knows in a variety of different ways that the patrolling, particularly of free blacks in Southern cities, much more so than what goes on on a plantation. Plantations handle their discipline problems in their own way. But if you're in Richmond, Virginia, and 30% of your population is African-American and 20% of that population is free, this is a, something I've written an awful lot about, the idea of asking, how do you control people who are developing their own churches? How do you develop, how do you uh, control people who are trying to organize their own labor union in the middle of a society that still has slavery? The whole idea is surveillance as opposed to simply intervention. You understand what I'm talking about? The idea of making sure that you've got a big hairy eyeball on what's going on and you know more than <coughs> is necessary to prevent trouble with a capital T. All of that has to do with the historical origins of what we're in now. The idea that somehow the police is a clean and <coughs> professionalized <coughs> sorry, social service that intervenes to keep us safe is the myth that sits on top of the reality, which is that the police is just as socially constructed as anything else is, and reflects all the biases and all the difficulties of that. Now, are there good policemen? Of course there are. Are there good teachers? Of course there are. Are there bad teachers? Of course there are. The problem, of course, is that it's a life and death matter when it comes to talking about uh, uh, police, if you want to get on the high end of things, or just systematic, awful harassment of dark-skinned people on the street, no matter what, uh, from every kind of microaggression you can think of. The idea of blue lives mattering is to me, and um, you know, I'm, I'm as ideological as anybody else, it's white backlash, a way to be able to deflect away from the real critique that you have to make of what law enforcement means to protect and serve. And so I don't know if that's a good answer that actually <laughs> convinces anybody of anything else that they hadn't already known, but uh, I see it much more as a, Every police department in every major city has a big police union that defends everybody, no matter what they do. And that's where most of that defense comes from. Blue lives matter. All lives matter. I mean, blue lives matter is simply a variant on all lives matter, which is a way to be able to repress the particular insistence that black lives haven't mattered and need to. Is that enough? Uh, you've got there are several people who have posted comments about um talking points? Are there a couple of um, perhaps nuggets or something that, that people yeah. could write down that's really quick that they can kind of uh, whip out if they get backed into a corner by someone just about, um, you know, white supremacy or, or Blue Lives Matter or something like just kind of quick bullets that they can have? See, this is the thing that, that that's really tough. These are good questions because these are questions that put me on the spot in trying to leverage my way to where I want to be rather than where the question wants me to go. What you're asking is how do you rebut somebody who's attacking you in a day, right? And I can do that as easily as anybody else can. I can take all the academic language that I just gave you a second ago and boil it down and say, well, you know, police departments have always been racist, always been full of white supremacy. What do we expect? At which point you're doing this. You understand what I'm talking about? I'm trying to figure out a way to get beyond doing that because we can't change each other's minds. So. I would try instead of answering that question to retreat to the kinds of stuff that I do. I would, um, I would say, all right, if this is the way you feel about things, tell me how you respond to, have you ever heard of Solomon Northup? Make a historical question. Now, Solomon Northup is not kidnapped by policemen, but he's encapsulated in a legal system that the police uphold that put him in slavery. Tell a story, not have a bullet point. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? 
are, are you suggesting, I'm just going to, I guess I'll try yeah. to speak for some of the people who have been commenting. Are you suggesting that instead of trying to convince or um, create a counter argument is to simply switch tactics entirely and say, yep. let's talk about something that is a real. So instead of talking about politics, let's talk about a historical person or a historical yeah. event. And that way yeah. derail the partisanship. Is that what yeah. you're, I don't mean to put well, words in your mouth. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. I mean, it's like Jesus telling parables. Well, some of us <laughs> no, seriously, we fall short of the mark. <laughs> what? I said some of us can't live up to the Jesus no, no, standard. No, but the, but I'm, not trying, I'm not trying to suggest it in that form. What I'm trying to suggest is that the parable is something that's got a problem in it that needs thinking about. Parables are that way. That's that just the way they are. They are illustrative lessons that tell a story where you have to extract a meaning as opposed to saying what you already know the other guy's going to rebut. What I'm desperately trying to get at here in all this stuff that I'm suggesting is a way to get beyond immediate what well, ideological politics to think about human beings. And so if you want to think about uh, if you want to think about uh, uh, blue lives matter, it seems to me that it's really important to ask the question. In some sort, I, I've never thought about this before. That's, that's why I said a second ago, I thought the question was really good because it puts me on the spot of how you take this approach that I'm trying to develop in a number of different areas and apply it to that specific. I don't know exactly how to do it, but it's gotta be a way to displace the ideology with an inquiry. It's just teaching. I, I... Dr. Stewart, I, this is Jim Ketchum in Troy, New York. Um, I, I think it has a whole lot to do with what you're doing with the t-shirts. Yeah. You're, you're telling a story. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that every time I get a bullet point, it's going to get shot back at me. Absolutely. But there's no better way than to get anybody to dig in their heels than to say to them, you're a racist. Yep. Uh, end of conversation. Mm-hmm. But if, if I can tell a story or get curious and say, why do you say, what does that mean? Blue That's lives exactly. matter. Mm -hmm. yep. And then we can begin to talk about how this came about, how this feeling came about. That's exactly right. And the idea that one way or another, we can't talk about this stuff among ourselves without getting all hammer locked into ideology is, explains what we're seeing on television. And at this late hour, the idea of thinking beyond that, through that, I couldn't agree with you more, Jim. Storytelling is what it's all about. It's the idea of the narrative. The narrative that's there and the narrative that a person, two people can do to displace the narrative that they got with a better one. It's not, no different than the kind of teaching. I'm sure, Michael, you know exactly what this is like in class, right? It's the way we teach. We don't lecture anymore. We don't tell people to memorize stuff. We get people to try to see how to construct, I'll use an academic term that will show just how far divorced we really are from the normal world, the intertextuality of documents. How do they talk to each other? What do, what do we say back to them? Uh, you know, it's, in, in a way, it's, uh, it's, you said it better than I did, Jim. It's, you're right. Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So go make a t-shirt about Troy, New York and see what happens. Um, we have a question from Jim Richmond. He'd like to know about the problem of al alternative facts. Um, he asks, um, how do you uh, deal with alternative facts without creating even more conflict? So what, do you have any advice for that? Alternative yeah, facts, of course, being I mean, they, fly, they fly around all the time. Um, Michael and I are basically involved in a multi-generational war against alternate facts, which is the history we inherited that came out of the 19th and early 20th century that was all about affirming white supremacy. You don't rebut that stuff point by point. You tell a better story. Again, it seems to me. You can't, the world of did Trump win the election, <laughs> if people want to believe that, there isn't any really good way to insert yourself into the middle of all that. I found that out today when I was buying my newspaper. Uh, no, I'm going to tell. I'm not going to tell that story. Um, 
the idea that we get into the habit of walking through the world not by responding to the headline, by saying, no, that's wrong. Let other people do that. They'll do that. The, the real facts, it seems to me, the truth is somehow built on a basis of value that solidifies and deepens an understanding that creates relationships. It's a very different way of thinking about fact than numbers. And to that extent, all, all the fake news that comes out is really a way to deny humanity. Think about it. The idea of being able to say, no, it's a fraud, it's a hoax, using Trump language, is a way to denature the minds of the people that you're trying to manipulate. And you can't respond to that by saying, 60 judges have just said that the election was perfectly fine. Nothing going to happen. The idea of trying to find a different way into the problem, which is, I guess, what I'm trying to do in a lot of what I'm up to, um, means ignoring that stuff. That's, that's empty calories for me, really, as much as I hate what they are. Well, I'm just I guess, uh, not, not Yeah, my guess that, I Go guess ahead, that describes why we have not been effective because, you know, and I'm guilty as anybody else, is you try to combat alternative facts with what you believe to be the truth. And I've done that online with a couple of people that have different mm -hmm. political views than I do. And it doesn't work. Nope. Nope. It doesn't work. You have to come at it from a different point. And I like your thought about based on value and humanity, telling storytelling and so on. Um, it might be an alternative way because I, I can tell you from personal experience, it doesn't work just to use the example that you did while well, 60 courts, it's obviously that the, the election wasn't stolen because it was 60 courts that said it wasn't. That doesn't bias any credibility with these people. No, no and uh, you're making the point better than I am really by just talking about your own struggles with this stuff. Um, what's happened, I mean, I, I've got members in my family I can't talk to. And some of this goes back to roots in fundamentalist religion that are really deep and really big and really ugly and so forth and so on. And my challenge was, I can talk to them now, to figure out new bridges to get over with them. I'm telling you more about myself than I had anticipated, but along with the basketball, there's this whole other story. Uh, how one way or another you try and keep family bonds together when you're being told by your elders that you're going to hell. Now, those are alternate facts of, of a very, very big kind. So the idea of one way or another being able to say, this is not where solid human relationships can be sustained. And to try instead to substitute something better for that. And better means being able to listen really, really carefully to what's coming at you, even though you don't want to, and to extrude a story out of that that one way or another you can relate to. I mean, I, I'm sorry to get so personal about things because it's not usually my style, but uh, no, you're right. Battering back and forth on the computer is not going to do anything for anybody except make it harder for everybody. So the idea of filling up the political culture with something better. Seems to me, it just seems to me a less stressful and better way to live, you know, for nothing else. Uh, I just want to say, I, I've been reading the, thank you everyone who's been commenting. We've had some really outstanding comments. I'm, I'm sure Dr. Stewart has, hasn't had an opportunity to look at them. I, I just want to let Dr. Stewart know that I think if I'm reading the comments correctly, that there is some frustration among, among many of you, at least that's been posting, um, it's difficult to conceptualize how to deal with someone who doesn't acknowledge even that the problem is a problem. I think if I'm trying to condense some of the comments we've had, I think that's, um, I mean, I think people understand and respect your approach to kind of sidestep the partisanship with some kind of story or narrative or, you know, try to change tracks. But if the person you're talking to doesn't even acknowledge that slavery was a thing perhaps, or that uh, one person commented, you know, people that don't even believe white privilege exists, like how do you even, it's not like you can change tracks, you're not even in the same no. mode of transportation at that point. Uh, it's I, like trying to drive a bus on a train track to blur my metaphors. Okay, well, okay. the other side of this, 
which uh, and again the question is really <laughs> what uh, draw out of me stuff that uh, that needs to be said in order to be able to represent myself properly if someone comes at me with full blown full blown full blown racism slavery we always had slavery who cares get over it or is using the n word or doing anything else you call them on that i mean this the point of leading a dignified anti racist life means that you have certain red lines that you don't let people transgress. It's not, so, sometimes it's just not worth it to try it. I mean, I'm talking about a way of living here, I guess. Is that's all you that's all you're really seeing in this little box, is my attempt to try to explain myself. And if someone is going to just get in your face about something, or if someone is going to get off atrocities, verbal atrocities, and um, demeaning atrocities that come directly at you, your job is to slap all that stuff down and retain your dignity and feel like you have a moral compass and a center that makes you want to do this stuff. I don't know what else to say. I mean, you're not, you're not in the business of trying to change everybody. You're trying to figure out a way to be able to work your way in the world where whatever it is that you walk through has a chance of being a little bit more enriched because you walk there. Yeah, I see. I, I guess, I guess my question is um, not so much for like blatant racism where people are using the N word or people are, you know, denying slavery or all the historical events, but the people that kind of walk that middle line where, you know, you, you are just like denying that there's systemic racism, you know, denying that there's police brutality, mm -hmm. denying that there's, you know, um, all other kinds of racism that exists that are in, in our structures. Like, how do you have those conversations? Because I'm one of seven children. I'm not speaking to six siblings right now or my mother because they do not believe that there is any systemic racism or anything that's going on at the Capitol. Or, and, and, and I never thought my family were racist, but there's such a divide right now and I'm on the outside of my entire family. And like, how do you, how yeah. do you navigate that? Yeah. can't do family therapy. <laughs> you know? um, and I, I, I don't mean that in, in, in any sort right. of... <laughs> no, but my, my, my question is, though, not the blatant, like I, I can handle it. Oh, no, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. The problem, it, it, a lot has to do with how you're constituted. I mean, one of the things that I guess I have going for me is that I spend a lot of time with Black people. And always have, since way back in the basketball days. I can tell a story about somebody who actually is very instrumental in historians against slavery, Nikki Taylor. You know Nikki. Uh, she's the chairman of the history department at Howard University, and she's an absolutely fabulous human being and a terrific historian. We're walking around Cincinnati together, and she walks into what was it back then? Uh, one of the big camera and electronic stores uh, to get some service done on her cell phone. I decide that I'll walk around and see what some of the products are while she's over there. Suddenly I turn around and the white guy on the other side of the counter is screaming at her, calling her every kind of vicious name that you can think of. That story is a story of macroaggression into microaggression. And it's a story I can tell on her behalf. And in those kinds of situations, those are the kinds of things I do. I mean, I know a lot of people who have had a lot of terrible things happen to them because they're skin color. And these are people who, it's, it's a cliche and I grind my teeth to say it, but some of my best friends are black people. And it's that experience that gives me a kind of authority to talk to people like the kinds of people that are bothering you about what I've seen rather than talking about what I believe. And the main point in all of this, it seems to me, and I mean, what would happen if everybody shopped where black people shop? What would happen if everybody decided that spiritual nurturing had to do with not just going in and observing, but actually joining a black church? What would happen if all of a sudden all of your annual giving was given to the local 
group that's doing the most for anti-racism work in that neighborhood. And instead of turning right when you go out the front door into your all white neighborhood, you turn left and show yourself up in a multicultural environment where you have to deal with what's coming at you. Those are all disruptive choices, just like the t-shirts. And to me, they represent a different way of living. I'm trying to live decently, that's all. I don't have very much time to live here anymore because I'm 80 years old. <laughs> and um, I want to go out feeling better than I might have felt if I hadn't done this stuff. <laughs> so again, I think my answers, and they all come down to pretty much the same thing. You have to tell a story where you have some authority. Imagine what it'd be like to be Nikki Taylor. Imagine what it's like to be me. How do I go over and defend her? What you're seeing in microcosm in a much less lethal way is a lynching. And the impact of that on everybody is just plain freaking enormous. And it's not an abstract question of is there a systematic racism or not? It's a story about what happened to somebody. And you can't tell the story by saying, well, look what happened to Emmett Till because no, that's just ideology again. It's gotta be something that, that, that is real flesh and blood. But that's just my own personal answer. You gotta work this stuff out your own way. But I, I think that the business of enriched experience that starts with me uh, being able to continue to figure out how to negotiate my way out of my white skin has an awful lot to do with whatever answer I want to give to your question. <laughs> Sorry. So is, racism, is racism the result of ignorance or it does it say something about the I'm sorry, you're cutting in and out. I can't hear you. Sorry, I apologize, Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much. Would you say, in brief, would you say, is racism the result primarily of ignorance or does it make a statement historically about the human condition? I think it makes a statement historically about the human condition. Um, that's a pretty, I mean, we, the whole question of where white supremacy comes from gets translated in the stories we like to tell about ourselves as Americans that somehow slavery was our original sin. We put it theologically, just to start with, you've all heard that, right? The idea that there's something inherent in something that happened that needs to be expiated. And it all is involved with theology and so forth and so on. I could assign a 15 book reading list and so could Michael that would show you how Initial explorers who went onto the coasts of Africa began to interpret blackness from England and began to make equations between dark skinned people and gorillas from the beginning, right from the very beginning. That this whole business of dark skin is registers in so many deeply moral and symbolic ways with what. They're not even called white people by that point of view. The people that are discovering, let's take England, for example, uh, blackness, call themselves Welch, <laughs> call themselves Scottish, call themselves, uh, you know, whatever, they're Celts or something like that. The idea, whiteness is something you can get constructed out of experience, and it's experience that is somehow, I'm trying to do this briefly, you asked me to do this briefly, and I hated that when you do that, um, to somehow redefine what good is in the world in an evil way. There's a scholar named David Brian Davis who died back a few years ago, who's done nothing but blow everybody's mind by how he's shown how that's worked out in so many different systems of slavery that have their origins in Africa. So it is something socially constructed deep in the Western human tradition of people who come from certain parts of Western Europe and England, yes. Is it involved with sin and salvation? You bet it is. Does it tell you how you interpret the Bible? Of course it always has. And in liberation theology, it will tell you a way to try and get out of all that. The idea that somehow racism is just a, a, a screen for exploitation makes no sense to me at all. There are all kinds of forms of exploitation in the world that you can put on people without having to categorize everybody who looks at a certain way. And they actually don't look like a certain way, you just think they do. 
so it is something that's involved with interiority. It has something to do with a kind of what some people would call a pathology. Yeah, I but think all we all in, we all enjoy the universal truth of of labor and the idea of species being forwarded by some guys like Marx and Engel that crosses racial lines. And I think that's what you're alluding to. But if if it is a deep historical statement about the human condition and not ignorance, then storytelling and narratives are usually pedagogically driven to teach and enlighten. And, and I, I worry, I worry that if it is a deep seated historical statement of the human condition, then shifting that is a monumental task. I agree, I couldn't agree more. But while we're at it, we are, uh, the two of us, or any of us here can roll out thousands of examples of people historically who've done just that. White abolitionists. Uh, the wealthy Jews all tied up with Sears and Roebuck who founded all those historically black colleges through the Julius Rosa Wall Fund. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Point about theology and the point about interiority and sin is there's also this notion of grace and redemption. The idea that one way or another, uh, there is, although we may or may not be able to summon it, the idea that one way or another, there is moral choice in the world. That there are ways in which we can be touched with insight. The stories touch you with insight if they're good stories, maybe. The ideology is never gonna do that because all that does is what we've been talking about. So yeah, I look at this, I'm not talking about something that works. I'm talking about at desperate measures and hope. You know, I take your point and I agree with it, but you gotta do it anyway. <laughs> is that all right? Is that an answer? It, it is, and, and I do find hope in your comments and I find inspiration in your life story. I mean, look at you. You could be sitting on a beach somewhere and you're talking to us in the middle of winter just trying to be emotionally accessible at a way that might resonate with us to go forward in our own way. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, <sighs> yeah, thank you. I mean, that, I take that as, a, as something I'll hold close to my heart. No, sir. All right, any, uh, we've gone on uh, much longer than uh, normal for this series. Does anyone have any last, uh, this is your last call, um, bars closing, so to speak. Um, if anyone has any final I'm comments. Or... People talk. I want to talk at the end of this, okay. I, what uh, was that, Dr. Stewart? Yeah. Is this Jim this, Ketchum? This is Jim, again, in, in Troy, New York. I, I've been smiling a lot with your last few comments since I'm a retired pastor. <laughs> um, um, and I've been involved in anti-racism um, issues literally since I was 10 years old. Um, and I, I, the big thing that I always try to remember is if I'm going to change somebody else, I, I can't. It's not possible. I cannot force them to change. Mm -hmm. The only person I can change is me. Mm -hmm. And if I can change me so that even as a big, relatively powerful white male, I simply absorb the attacks against me. Sure. If I put myself in a, in a risky position, risk my, uh, my status, um, that says a lot more than any bullet point. Yeah, There's no, I think that's here. right. And I'm sure you've learned that the best thing to do with anger is to lean into it when it's coming at yeah. you. Absolutely. And yeah. that's, that's a key technique I learned in Aikido. Is, by yep. the way, you step into the attack. That's exactly uh, right. And yep. you make contact with your attacker the best you can. Yep. Yep. Anybody else? Any last thoughts? Uh, I, I will say I've, I've posted the link to Dr. Stewart's um, YouTube page where he's posted his video series. Uh, I think if you want to spend some time, they're, they're, they're relatively short videos and each is on a different topic, but they all kind of tackle this larger issue. Uh, that we've been dealing with tonight. So if, if you're, uh, if you want more and you want some more specificity, perhaps you can watch those videos. Also, Dr. Stewart's given you his email address a dozen times, very generously. So some Stewart professors and scholars don't want you to know their personal address. Okay.
M-A-C-A-L-E-S-T-E-R dot E-D-U. Okay? I'll reply to anybody who talks to me. Yeah. And, and the History Center will use our social media and we'll post Dr. Stewart's links and email and, and give that information to whoever wants it. But one of the things Dr. Stewart excels at is being open and available, um, <laughs> which is, again, fairly unusual for ivory tower types, but he, he is totally approachable. As you can see tonight, um, it's like you want to grab a tea or a beer with him anytime. He'll he'll do it, um, even virtually. Uh, so with with, with that, uh, Dr. Stewart, did you have some final comments, or do you want to say good night? Well, geez, uh, I guess the the real measure of this for me is how valuable it is in just being able to somehow take all these different facets of what I've been. <laughs> developing just sort of moment to moment, week to week, month to month, and have to try to represent it. Uh, you guys are really good questioners. You make me feel both welcome and challenged. You make me feel as if on the other end of this is a group of people that I wish I could work with more, <laughs> that this is the kind of community that does preach past the choir because that's the question that you're all asking. And so all I'm going to do is close with a expression of gratitude for letting me do this. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. And thank okay. you to all of you who joined us this evening. Like we said, we'll post Dr. Stewart's uh, uh, publications and videos. Um, he's got actually a, a publication coming out, an essay on this very topic coming out tomorrow. tomorrow? Okay, yep. look, check our social media page, check, check uh, everything that's History Center, and uh, you'll see it there. This is, we're in the thick of it. We're, we're, we're doing current events right now. Um, thank with that, you. I'll, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. night, everyone. Be safe. Hey, I'll, off. I'll take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.